Today's webinar is the second in a series regarding the Highway Safety Manual presented by the Florida Department of Transportation. Today's webinar regards the HSM's Part B on roadway network screening. Good morning. My name is Jack Freeman, and I welcome you to this webinar training. I am a senior principal with Kittleson & Associates in Orlando, Florida. My contact information is shown on this slide, and please feel free to contact me individually after this webinar with any questions you may have that we have not sufficiently answered during the course of the webinar. Today is the second in a series of nine webinars. The previously conducted webinars can be found on the FDOT Office of Safety website. The learning objectives of today's webinar regarding Part B of the roadway safety management process is why is roadway safety management important? Well, it really provides a systematic and repeatable process for identifying opportunities to reduce crashes and identifying potential countermeasures. Today's learning objectives of the webinar are the elements of roadway safety management process, the elements of network screening, the 13 HSM performance measures, and a safety analyst software review. In the second half of this webinar, Dr. Priyanka Aluri at Florida International University will update us on the activities she's been undertaking regarding AASHTO's Highway Safety Analyst uh, software and its forthcoming implementation in Florida. So again, the Highway Safety Ma Manual is a, in part in four parts. We are addressing today Part B, which is the Roadway Safety Management. It has six chapters uh, within it. Um, the Network Screening Chapter, Chapter 4, Chapter 5, Diagnosis, going through selection of countermeasures, then looking at economic evaluation, prioritization, and safety effectiveness evaluation. And if you think about it, these are the steps that you go through as you are evaluating a project. Screen it, go through the diagnosis, going through and selecting countermeasures, doing that economic evaluation, prioritization, and then doing an after evaluation. So this provides you in a step-by-step -step process how you would go through that process within safety management area. There are a number of available resources supporting the Highway Safety Manual. You can purchase the Highway Safety Manual online. You can also get additional information from the FDOT website and the website information is provided here. Uh, there is a March 2016 Highway Safety Manual Rata Sheet that has been published. Uh, there are HSM user guides that are out from uh, NCHRP and TRB, plus Florida DOT also has their own uh, user guide that's available on the website. Uh, the Plans Preparation Manual has a number of different things regarding the Highway Safety Manual. And finally, there's uh, what we refer to as NCHRP 1738 spreadsheets uh, that apply the predictive uh, method. Uh, these are available in the FDOT website and the MUTS uh, location and I uh, just want to le let you know that these have been recently updated so that the if you've downloaded them previously I suggest you re-download them uh, to get the latest version of the spreadsheet. So now it's focusing on part B and the nine different chapters. I've already talked about how they flow together and you can again can see here how it flows from chapter 4 through chapter 9 uh, from network screening and going through that diagnosis and countermeasure selection, looking at that economic appraisal and prioritization and the effectiveness evaluation. It's really a step-by-step -step, uh, process that we go through within the safety management process. And we'll talk about each of those in a little bit greater detail. The first is network screening, which is chapter four. Um, it is review the, reviewing the transportation network and going through that, identifying uh, problem locations, roadway segments, corridors, basically what are those candidate locations, and then uh, goes through a ranking process based upon the potential uh, for reducing crash frequency. Um, then once you have identified those, you go through a diagnosis, and it's very, you know, 
systematic process that you go through to evaluate and identify uh, crash patterns. It uh, is a considers information such as crash data, historic site data, uh, field conditions, and other information that may be important to, to the site. The next step in the process, which is chapter six, is to select countermeasures. And this is, again, the diagram, the Venn diagram you've seen before, that crashes are a combination of factors, roadway factors, human and um, vehicular factors all contribute to crashes. And it's important to note that as we look at the Highway Safety Manual, the Highway Safety Manual only addresses the engineering side and the engineering countermeasures that we can apply to uh, addressing different types of crash countermeasures. Things of enforcement and education are not within the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, we're strictly looking at engineering. But as you go through and uh, this process, you will identify and select countermeasures so that you can then get into uh, the next part, which is diagnosis. So the first poll question is, what tools or processes have you used to d determine countermeasures for application at an intersection? As we move on into the evaluation process, the next step is conducting that economic appraisal and going through and evaluating the, the benefit and cost of the overall improvement. We've talked a little bit about that in the previous webinar, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today as we go through it uh, to determine whether the projects are cost effective, economically justified as we go through and evaluate uh, different types of uh, countermeasure applications. The next step in it is prioritize the projects and based upon economic justification, looking at different sites and, uh, and across multiple sites, whether you're doing a project related or a systemic type of improvement, uh, being able to improve, look at those improvement projects based upon cost, mobility, economic factors, and safety improvement as well. The final step of Part B in the overall safety management process is uh, in Chapter 9, which is discussed the safety effectiveness evaluation. And this is the looking at it after and going through and being able to review the value of that improvement. It's looking at that countermeasure effectiveness. It's looking at the crash reduction that you may have had, uh, not only from the standpoint of frequency, but also from the standpoint of severity and have you really reduced fatalities and serious injuries which was one of the goals that you have uh, in looking and evaluating different types of improvements that you do. So let's take an example and look at an example of how you could use Part B and the analysis processes of Part B to be able to go through and evaluate um, a, a particular improvement. This one happens to be a network screening that has focused on pedestrian and bicycle crashes. And look countywide, it's a mapping that was done for pedestrian and bicycle crashes in Brevard County, considering crash severity as a factor. And it applied the equivalent property damage only performance measure that's available within Part B of the Highway Safety Manual and provided a ranking of the severe ped and bike crashes uh, to be determined. This ranking was based upon the scoring, the equivalent property damage only scoring, uh, known as a severity score. In doing this screening, you should be consider other factors such as ongoing studies, ongoing construction, which may take a location out of consideration. The, in this particular ranking, the uh, it, corridor of US-1 from, from Broadway Boulevard to Fay had the highest ranking and in the overall severity score. The next step is going through diagnosis and looking at that corridor in diagnosis. Uh, the diagnosis step is to really to evaluate the crash data in detail and looking at overall corridor uh, the quarter did not have roadway lighting with the majority of the crashes during the periods of darkness. 
field review revealed that it was difficult to see pedestrians at night so that, and there were multiple crashes involving impaired uh, pedestrians. The next step is the selection of countermeasures. In evaluating potential countermeasures, the installation of roadway lighting was considered. A lighting justification was suggested for the corridor. In conducting the economic appraisal part, a roadway lighting justification study was conducted following the procedures of FDOT MUTS Manual Chapter 14. You can see the procedure here, the process was done, um, and it resulted in a benefit cost ratio of 13.4 for corridor lighting, and lighting was justified. And next step of the process to prioritize projects and the lighting of the quarter is programmed in the current work program and will is about to be constructed so the overall network screening process is a process of reviewing transportation network to identify and rank sites from most likely to least likely to realize a reduction in crash frequency uh, with the implementation of a of countermeasures. The HSM outlines a five-step process. Establish the focus, step one. Step two is to identify reference populations. What do we mean by that? It's looking at, are we looking at signalized intersections only? Are we looking at unsignalized intersections only? Are we looking at locations uh, that have a specific type of uh, needs from a pedestrian or bicycle perspective. It's that type of reference population that we're looking at. And then we go through and select uh, performance measures, um, go through and do screening methods, and then uh, screen and evaluate results. And we'll go through and talk about each of these five steps as we step through an example. Step one of the network screening process is really looking at from a focus of overall crash reduction where an agency wishes to identify or rank sites where improvements have the potential to reduce the number of crashes. Or it could be a policy implementation where an agency is implementing a particular safety-based strategy or policy. To do so, they would evaluate the network to identify sites with a particular crash type. An example of this would be a high number of runoff through road crashes to prioritize the placement of non-standard guardrail on a statewide basis. So exa more example types of uh, safety policies and programs include uh, traffic infraction detectors such as red light cameras, the me cable median barrier implementation, which was done on Florida's interstate system and Florida's turnpike, public information programs regarding seatbelts, alcohol, you know, safety, uh, pedestrian safety regarding project programs such as Best Foot Forward, road departure and looking at rumble strips and vibratory pavement marking and high-risk rural roads. All of these are different types of example safety programs that which could be considered. The second is to identify your reference population and that is to identify those network elements to be screened. In this particular case, Intersections are highlighted, but it could be anything. It could be roadway segments. It could be fatalities. It could be ramps. It could be ramp terminal intersections. You can go through and be able to organize by a reference population as you go through the process. And if you look at this, uh, an example of, of identifying reference populations, this happens to be what is the significance population of implementing um, What's the reference population for implementing signalized, uh, signalization treatments? For example, red light cameras. You would go back in and look at, you would do this where signalized intersections are, so that's your reference population is different examples of signalized intersection. Third step is select performance measures. And you can look at that from a number of different uh, types of performance measures uh, in evaluating the potential to reduce the number of crashes or crash severity. Uh, just as intersection traffic operations can be measured using performance measures such as vehicle delay, queue length, volume to capacity ratio, intersection safety can be quantifiably measured 
to, in terms of expected crash frequency, expected crash severity, uh, critical crash rate, etc. So you can look at things from a different perspective and going through and the Highway Safety Manual includes 13 different performance measures uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So performance-based criteria um, looks at and considers uh, you know, data availability, uh, going through and considering regression to the mean and how performance threshold is established. Um, the regression to the mean bias is when sites are selected for treatment based upon short-term trends in observed crash frequency. Given the rarity of crashes, and in particular with high severity, one and, and even two year periods will not be long enough to know with certainty that a trend of, or anomaly has emerged. For example, a site is selected for treatment based upon high observed crash frequency being very short two years. The site's long-term cra crash frequency may be substantially lower and the result in the pro proposed treatment may, may have been more cost effective at an alternate site. Performance threshold provides a reference point for comparison of performance measures from, with, from specific sites, excuse me. So the Highway Safety Manual has 13 different performance criteria. And the chart you see before you, as you go down, uh, the left-hand side says more data and counts for regression to the mean bias. So as you go down in the chart, it requires more data, and, but it also accounts for regression to the mean bias. It also, on the right-hand side, the red arrow shows greater reliability. So right at the top of the chart are the ones that we've used for a number of years, average crash frequency, crash rate, um, and the one I mentioned earlier, equivalent property damage only, are examples of that. We've also statewide used critical rate, and that's red highlighted. Critical rate is looking at the different uh, and evaluating. We also know it as critical ratio here in the state of Florida. And I also want to highlight as we move down that you'll start seeing toward the bottom expected average crash frequency with empirical base adjustments, um, equivalent property damage only with empirical base adjustments, we are getting into, and these do account for regression to the mean. So these are higher level and uh, have greater reliability in their overall evaluation. So as a polling question, is critical rate, also known in the state of Florida as critical ratio, considered to be more reliable, a more reliable performance measure than crash rate? Moving on to step four, select a screening method. The Highway Safety Manual divides the, the screening methods based upon segments, intersections, and corridors, and there are uh, three different methods. The first is for segments, we have what we call the sliding window. A window of specified length is moved in increments of a specified length along the roadway segment from beginning to end. So you could pick it up and move it in quarter mile segments along that, evaluate the number of crashes within that segment. And based upon the results of all the window uh, positions, the window position that has the highest value uh, according to the performance measure is used to represent the performance measure for that entire roadway segment. The peaking searching method subdivides each roadway segment into windows of similar length, potentially enlarging the length incrementally until the length of the window equals the length of the entire corridor. Uh, in each window, the chosen performance measure is, is calculated. So as we move on to intersections and look at the simple ranking, the performance measure is calculated for all sites under consideration, and the results are ordered from high to low. And corridors can use any one of the three methods, sliding window, peak searching, or simple ranking. We'd go through, and then it's part of step four, calculate the performance measure for each segment intersection node and be able to go through it and rank and order these uh, to look at getting into countermeasure selection. 
summarize the screening overview uh, and looking and summarizing steps two, three, and four, we'll take an example. Uh, your focus is crash reduction on sub urban and suburban signalized intersections on state roads, which is known as, shown here as reference population. The performance measures you choose, shown in blue, are based upon a daily, available data and looking at different types of performance measures: crash rate, equivalent property damage only, and crippled equivalent property damage only with the with the expected crash frequency from EB adjustment. And the overall screening method is a simple ranking. So, so but before we get into the examples, let's kind of summarize where we are within the webinar and some of the different steps that we've taken. Um, again, one of the things we wanted to discuss in learning objectives are the elements of the roadway safety process, and we talked about those steps and how the six chapters of the Highway Safety Manual uh, Part B summarize that. What are the elements of network screening and going through that? Uh, and we're moving now into the discussion of the 13 HSM uh, performance measures and how we can apply different measures of the 13 HSM performance measures. So now what we'd like to do is use your webinar chat box and we'd like for you to enter in responses to these two questions. Can you provide an example of where you've conducted a citywide or countywide network crash screening for a particular reference population? And if you have, what types of performance measures did you use to rank the locations? And we'll take a few minutes and go live. All right. So one of the first methods, we, and we discussed this earlier in webinar one, is the crash rate method. Uh, the method is, is simple. Um, it uh, accounts for crashes by location. Um, it uses vo you know, pedestrian traffic volume, uh, but it also does not account for regression to the mean. And you can see directly from the Highway Safety Manual some of the strengths and limitations that are shown here. Um, it also does not is not a linear representation or the crashes that we've seen historically are not a re linear representation and the crash rate method represents that as a linear representation. But we'll go through and talk about uh, crash rate uh, and how do we go through that method. The first method is a crash rate method. And the first step of that is to calculate a uh, million entering vehicles for all years of crash data. And this particular equation is what we would apply for an intersection because there's total entering vehicles into the intersection. You could also use this for a segment, um, <coughs> but it would be total entering vehicles along the segment. It requires, crash, the, requires crashes by location and traffic volume, and the crash rate is the total observed crashes at the intersection divided by the million vehicles entering the intersection, which is shown in the next equation here. So again, it's number of crashes observed times the middle million vehicles entering for the, for the intersection. So as an example, we have a database of 10 candidate sites and five years of data. Um, and these are looking at you know, different intersections here and the overall number of uh, crashes broken down by CAPCO and uh, going through and evaluating. And if we take these and we start looking at, you know, what is the critical rate, you know, is the question is, you know, using the crash, critical rate formula, determining the intersection with the highest crash rate. So you have total crashes, you know, intersection numbers, you have total crashes, and you have million entering vehicles. So it's again total crashes divided by a million entering vehicles and you go through and develop the crash rate for each of those. Um, and you calculate it, you know, if we look at intersection number one, next slide, it's, you know, the number of crashes is 257 divided by the million vehicles entering vehicles and the crash rate happens to be 3.0. 
and you go through the same process for each and every location. So going through the same process for each of the 10 intersections shown here, uh, you can go through and calculate the crash rate and you, you will see that the crash rate uh, varies between a high of 4.2 down to a low of 0.4 uh, and you can develop a simple rank uh, where intersection number 8 is the highest ranked of it, uh, and highest ranked at 4.2, uh, intersection number 6 is the second highest ranked uh, with a crash rate of 4.0 So and being able to develop that ranking. So let's look at how we would do this now if we were to consider in the factor equivalent property damage only and the evaluation of that. Um, and the equivalent property damage only basically assigns weighting factors by crash severity. Uh, the societal crash cost that we have from the plans preparation manual is shown in this slide uh, by CABCO scale. And we can develop from this a weighting factor. So using the societal cost, we can create the equivalent property damage only weighting factors. Uh, the equation you see here is basically uh, the crash cost for a crash severity being fatal uh, injury A, B, etc., always divided by the same denominator, which is uh, societal crash cost for property damage only. The example you see below is for a uh, fatal weighting factor, and is therefore $10,230,000 uh, divided by the cost for a property damage only crash of $7,600, and it results in a weighting factor of, of 1,346. This is continued on in the next slide, and you can see the weighting factors for the different types of uh, crashes uh, based upon FDOT's uh, societal crash costs, and see how they vary, and of course PDO being one, because that's the denominator. So as we get into and we develop the uh, equivalent property damage only score, also known as severity score, uh, we go through and develop uh, this based upon the weighting factor, time, the number of observed crashes for fatals, number of observed crashes for um, t injury A crashes, injury B crashes, et cetera and go through that so it's observed crash times weighting factor as you go through this equation. So going back to our database of candidate sites and looking at the, the crash severity data for each intersection, we can then go through the calculation of determining the EPDO score or the severity um, ranking. So as we go through the equivalent property damage only score calculations. We've done this for you. Uh, we provided the scores here and you can see how they came and then we've gone through the ranking process. Uh, the That with the highest score was intersection number eight. Uh, intersection number six was second uh, and this happened to be the highest ranking uh, or the same ranking as the crash rate. However, I'd like to note that I've used this method quite a few times before on uh, pet and bike uh, network screening and analysis and oftentimes we see uh, locations that have relatively few crashes uh, but have a number of fatalities and serious injuries ranked very highly and you will see great differential between crash rate and equivalent property damage only uh, as you go through the analysis. Another method to be to use is equivalent property damage crash frequency with empirical Bayes adjustment. Um, and since we haven't gone through uh, a good EB analysis, I'll only introduce this to you now. Uh, but it develops a, uh, a single combined frequency and severity score by location. And the advantage of this over the previous analysis, it does account for regression to the mean bias. Uh, it goes through and considers the crash severity and, and using weighting factors just as we did, uh, but it may overemphasize uh, locations with a small number of severe crashes. 
Uh, so you need to be cautious as you go through it uh, in uh, doing this analysis method. So the data needs to do this method are crashes by severity and location, uh, severity weighting factors, which we previously had, but now you're getting into traffic volumes and, and major and minor street approaches, basic site characteristics, such as roadway cross-section, traffic control, and also uh, your safety performance function and over dispersion parameters uh, we need to be able to go through and do this analysis.